So my history with the Dvorak concerto goes back a long way. I think I was about nine years old when I first heard it, possibly. Somehow I got a record of Rostropovich playing it with Adrian Bolt conducting. And I went through a craze of just listening to it every day, though I think I only listened to the first moment because, of course, then it was records and I was too lazy to turn over for the second and third moments. Um, but I listened again and again and fell in love with this piece. Um, so this must have been, yeah, nine, ten, eleven, something like that. And then when I was 12, I begged my teacher to let me start playing the piece. And she gave in, and I did, and I was 12. And my father, who was an amateur violinist, was very disapproving. He thought, that's a terrible idea. You're much too young to start learning playing the Dvorak concerto. And he arrived to pick me up after my lesson. I said, listen, I can play it. And I played in the first bars, and he put his hands over his ears and said, ugh, so out of tune. Which it probably was, to be fair. Um, anyway, I kept practicing it, and then when I was 14, I first performed it. I, first, I performed the first moment at my school um, with the orchestra there, which I think probably wasn't very good. But then I performed the whole piece with the orchestra at a festival in Austria that was run by my teacher. And the horrible thought is that that was 1973, which means that I must have started playing it around 1971. So I've been playing that piece this piece for 50 years and in a couple of years time I can celebrate my 50th anniversary of the first time I performed it. Cellists have to, and conductors and orchestras, have to make their own version really. I think Henley's done absolutely the right thing by going with basically base, basing your new edition on the first edition, the Simrock, because as far as we know, those were Dvorak's final thoughts. But what we don't know is what Dvorak really wrote about it, how much sort of input Hanush Vihan had, the cellist for whom it was written. Um, I mean, his hand is even on the, you know, on the manuscript, offering corrections, putting in corrections. So we just don't know how much Dvorak really changed and how much he was pressured to change or whatever. So I think it's very interesting to look back at the earlier version of the concerto. And I was brought up with, a, with an edition based much more closely on that manuscript, that earlier manuscript, um, than the first edition. And just to look and see what cellists prefer. I mean, there's some things I prefer in the, in the Simrock in the first edition, and there's some things I prefer in the manuscript. And that's just an entirely personal choice. But I think cellists should all make their personal choice. I think what Henley has done is for, to, as I say, to base the, the edition on, on the Simrock is absolutely right. But you offer, as well, many sort of different readings from earlier versions, I think. So the cellists can pick and choose. So there are all these different versions that one has to decide between to, in order to make an addition. They can be puzzling, but I don't find anything that's really finally inexplicable. As I say, I sort of prefer some, some of the earlier versions to the, to the first edition, but I think everything's there. The only passage I've changed myself, no, there's two passages I've changed myself, um, from anything Dvorak wrote, and that's sort of a bit naughty, but I do it purely because I think it sounds better, is the passage just before the recapitulation of the first moment, where, as I say, when I play it, Dvorak's original sounds like a, a donkey having a nervous breakdown, and I don't think that's what he wanted, really. Um, and that's how I feel. It just doesn't sound good. And then the osseo is possible. But for me, it sounds a bit weak. Um, so I do, as many people do, I do double stops, six and sevenths, um, which I think sounds better. And again, it's not crucial. It's just another way of playing the passage. And then towards the end of the first moment, 
I put the sort of the melodic triplets on the top line um, rather than the Dvorak's version where he has it on the bottom line. I don't think you can hear it very clearly in the, there's some octaves coming down from the triplets. Um, but again, you know, those are really tiny details. And you told me that there's a, there's, you've already been asked a question whether in the, the second phrase the cello has that it really could be a syncopated E major chord and then the E, it's not bad. It would sound horrible as a grace note, you know, it would just sound messy. So I could absolutely, but I have no problem with that, that bar at all. Um, there's nothing, you know, there's some things, there's a G sharp I play in the first movement that people can jump. In fact, when I played it with the Berlin Philharmonic, they beg me not to do it for the second performance, but I like it and it's in the manuscript. And there's a big question about whether the, at the very end, just before the cello uh, sort of ushers in the final tutti, whether it's a D natural or a D sharp 16th in the, in the violins, just before the pizzicato D sharp, it's the last note before that. Um, but the cello has played D natural, so I don't know, I sort of go with Charles McCarris, who left a message on my machine once, because I'd left a message for him asking about it. He said, it can't possibly be a D sharp, or it would be a false relation, it would be horrible. I asked the violins to play D natural. Well, I think these the passages where you have osseous. I mean, no cellist plays the osseous I mean, most of them because just for ego reasons, because they're easier, and therefore it looks as if we can't play the difficult bits. So we egotistical cellists always go for the more difficult ones. Um, I think some of the passages where we actually, there's no osseo written, um, like the passage where the cello is accompanying the winds in the sort of second theme of the second group, we could say, and the cello is going, you do, you do, you know. It was original, it was just 16th, which, you know, I can see why Bihan changed it to something more impressive. But it's very interesting to know what was there originally because that shows you that it's an accompaniment. So it's so many cellists, because it's difficult and flashy, they play it really loudly and not listen to the winds. But the original just focuses your mind on what the passage is about. So I think that's interesting to know. Um, there's only there's the two places in the first movement where I actually do something Forshak hasn't written. I'm a bit ashamed, but it's only because they really do sound better when I play them, the versions I play. But I'm always encouraging other cellists try try and do Dvorak's version, you know. And if you can make it sound great, wonderful. I can't, but um, one should always start with the composer's version. And then, but as I say, it's it's passages, virtuoso passages, which are not. Um, it's not going to change the meaning of the piece at all to play them one way or the other, as long as you don't change the harmonies, which of course I don't. The basic harmonies. Uh, so one has a certain freedom with those passages, but, but one has no freedom not to respect Dvorak's markings and tempo markings and his, the way he writes the piece as a grand symphonic work. And, you know, one has to understand is when one is company, when one has an equal voice and when one is the principal voice. I advised not to put Vian's fingerings and bowings in the part, and thank you for taking my advice on this, because they're really from another era, and you know, where cellists did these huge glissandian things, and I don't know, it's, it seems to me they're not particularly musical, but there's also the question of Vian, how musical was he? How much did he understand the piece? And I'm not sure he did, I mean, yes, Dvorak asked for him to do the first performance in London, but then, when he couldn't, not only did Leo Stern, the English cellist, give the first performance in London, Dvorak brought him to Prague to give the first performance there. And Vihan, meanwhile, had tried to insert a cadenza of his own into the piece. We have no idea where, because there's nowhere it would fit, and it's ghastly, it's awful. And I've looked at it, and it's incredibly difficult to, if he could play it, then he was a good cellist, at least technically. But it's, it's horrible, and it would have wrecked the piece. And so, 
I must say, you know, with some, some performers of the past, like Joachim with Brahms, that's very different because Brahms obviously relied on Joachim and took his brilliant suggestions. And Vihan obviously did make some very good suggestions, but I think he made some very bad ones as well. And for me, the, it would just be confusing to have the, his fingerings and bowing. I mean, it's great we've got them in the score, so again, any cellist can study them. Um, but either you'd have had, had to have had three parts, which would have made it very heavy, this poor edition, um, <laughs> drooped, um, or, you know, or put them in into the, the blank solo part without my input, and that, I think it just makes it no longer blank, it makes it an interpretation, it's Vihan's interpretation. So I think you did just the right thing, putting it in the piano score, Vihan's things, and then leaving the your version completely clean, and which I hope Jellis will basically use with an odd glance at my one for suggestions. My markings are suggestions, they're not instructions, they're suggestions. And many cellists will completely disagree with them, and that's how it should be. You know, that's, basically, with this edition, we're just continuing a discussion. Basically, and, um, you know, every cellist will have his own view of the piece, and the fingerings and bowings, and all the other markings are part of that view. And um, everybody's got to have his own journey with the piece and arrive at his own, his or her own destination. Uh, well, or keep travelling. I mean, mine's still changing all the time, because it does with a masterpiece. Great music says something different to you every day. Um, and Dvorak's Cello Concerto is definitely great music. <laughs>